And what I love about Rome is I walk. I believe very much in walking. I don't believe in driving. And um, the whole, my whole orientation has been toward experiencing things, what people can experience by, on their own two feet, touching and looking. And, and uh, at least that's where a lot of my architecture has, has been. Um, one of the first things I want to show you is a house that I had built for myself. It was a classic thing of there being a problem lot. Nobody wanted to touch it. You stood at the top and you looked down into a pit of 25 feet, but it had a fantastic view and uh, it was a challenge and, and I'm sort of excited about it and I'll show it to you. It was built a number of years ago. Um, and I did it in conjunction with my husband who uh, I sold it because he, he passed away and uh, but still, I, I feel very, very much attached to it. That experience of my husband being ill and so forth, I just happened to find myself in another office which specialized in hospitals. Seems sort of natural. And I find myself very sensitive to people in the environment of accepting that people do go in the hospitals, families are in hospitals. And for the past I hate to say, seven years I've been specializing in hospitals and hospital environments. And this I find challenging its own way. I get a lot of the, the, the pleasures that I get is working directly with the clients. And I love to go back into my hospital to look at the patients, which I said, and get a feel. I have, I have a pediatrics ward, and I just love, I go in there with the kids with their broken arms and whatnot, and they're beaming. I just, you know, I feel good if I've created a good environment. I also love working with the contractors. It just totally shakes them up to have a woman on the job. <laughs> Usually I'll start a job, there'll be a new contractor, and my initial connection is, is in, uh, writing. And I write very nasty letters. I sort of start off and, and I um, make it very clear because there's always a little bit of, you ha I can't uh, explain it. It's not, you know, uh, contractors are always wanting to substitute things that are a little cheaper. At least that's what I've found. And um, so I, I make, uh, I sort of, uh, as I think Ingrid was saying, you sort of have to establish where you are with them. And then I usually make a eye-to-eye uh, -eye contact with them, and, and uh, that usually sets it. Anyway, I really love them, and I love working with the subcontractors. And, and uh, this is where my, my pleasures come, really, getting out on the job, working with the people individually, all the different, in all the different areas. Um, presently, I have nothing to show of a major project I've been working on for a number of years will be completed next September and December, which is a mental health center and rehabilitation and diagnostic and treatment. And I find it very exciting. I've designed all the furnishings and everything for the convenience of a wheelchair patient. For the, there's a lot being done in the, for the handicap and for the mental health patients. And getting totally away from an institutional environment. And this, this is what I, I think. Okay, I guess I better <laughs> stop that and maybe, uh, John, I'm going to start with uh, my house. Okay. Uh, okay, I want to just emphasize with a fantastic view. Couldn't resist. I mean, with a view like that, you just have to have a lot of glass. This is the model of it. You start at the top and you just drop down 25 feet. So we ended up having, you could drive in at three levels. <clears throat> it's a three-story house, but you can actually drive a car in. And um, the only flat portion was where you can see just behind the pool area. So what we did was we extended uh, the flat area and built into the hill because it was, you know, there really wasn't very much uh, in the way of a lot in that so looking up to the slope. Anyway, okay. there it is, before any of the planting, so it looks like a model. And again. But from the top, from the living room, we couldn't resist. You had to have 
uh, 180 degree view on it on every side. The entrance. This is as you come in. Just, uh, give you a general feeling. But that looks out to the Pacific all the way down the coast. I, I sort of like to feel that as you walk through a space, everything is, you know, is an excitement. Okay, this is the Venice Canal project. I did these renderings all on rice paper. <laughs> it's sort of uh, fun. Actually, I think it's, no, that's backwards. The portion right there um, at the far left is the part that Howard Hughes owns, and that's the only way to get in there. And what I was trying to develop is an all pedestrian kind of area with different densities. Some are sort of um, single estates where the small little alcove is, would be a shopping center. Um, and the, the ocean is up at the top. The north. But there would just be sort of some towers, some high density that would allow for, uh, uh, you know, uh, more open areas. And then just some real small scale things. These were designed. Uh, all the cars would be underneath. You'd come directly underneath, and then everything's pedestrian and experienced. Then this is the little convent I was telling you about, and uh, Margot Siegel was saying how you know we didn't, didn't have any money in your chapel for glass, and that was the same thing. I sort of designed that stained glass, so-called stained glass window, with the sort of the least expensive. Uh, colored glass that I could find and sort of developed it. But anyway, for 80,000 it wasn't too bad. And, uh, my little also, I wanted a whole feeling, because that's, uh, that's without the roof, but the whole feeling is, is that this is a convent, it's private. The sisters were really disturbed by that um, sun deck. There was a, um, what do you say, a monastery with the priest next door, and they were really afraid that the priest would spy on them. <laughs> This is just a detail of the chapel, and I was borrowing some space from the toilets upstairs to get a little bit of clear story light. But, uh, and then that little tower to sort of, again, everything, I was just taking a lot of borrowed light. This is just a detail of the real building, and I, I couldn't, I sort of didn't have the time. I buried a lot of my slides. Somewhere I have the actual thing, but this is uh, in construction. But that's sort of the feeling of the, the tower. And, and now this is the project I've been working on. It just goes on and on and on. Uh, <laughs> starts in the middle. There was an existing tower before I joined the company, built in 68. The one just slightly, I'm talking about in the center, slightly to the um, right is the Grunick Tower. And we've been sort of doing each floor almost in a different way. We've got a critical care floor. We had just a nursing floor administrative, and we had ICU, CCU, then we had another nursing floor. At Christmas, I opened up an OB floor. Right now, down here, this is out in the valley at Northridge. Down on the far left is the Institute for Living, which uh, the first two floors are um, outpatient and inpatient um, mental health. And the third and fourth are rehab rehabilitation, and the fifth is a conference room. And in the back is a large, um, diagnostic and treatment with emergency radiology and um, surgical. And uh, eventually there's a parking structure and then eventually there might be a medical building, but the other two are in construction. Uh, on the left is the uh, existing building and the Grunick Tower um, is the one on the uh, right here. Now I just, I just give you a little bit of the interior, just for better or for worse, a hospital room. Everything's been going to single single one room. Um, we don't want to make them look too nice, then people don't want to leave. But they are all wall-to-wall -wall carpeting, and they're, I don't know. This is, this is the OB. Um, it is fun. Usually you can't let kids in, but what we've developed with a little area so that the kids can see their new brothers and sisters, and I just try and get a, a warmer, just generally a warmer feeling into a, 
um, a hospital. <laughs> but if we're designing nursing station, whatever. This is back in the... Uh, maybe I put this flaming red right into the uh, delivery area. And people said, you know, how could that be done? I, I know, people have all these weird ideas on colors and fun, but I, I like to give people a little surprise. And, get, and then this is um, actually, you know, with uh, contraceptive and abortion, people are not having as many babies, and there has to be a lot of PR to get people to have babies and go to hospitals now. <laughs> so what they do as part of their promotion is they have a candlelight dinner. You say, if you have a baby, you get a champagne candlelight dinner, and this is where they give it. <laughs> anyway, this has been sort of fun. Here's my, the teens and the teen center. And this is remodeling only, but I, I just had a little bit of fun and try to, again, try to get away from a whole hospital kind of environment. Um, they were telling me that sometimes when they have an overflow, they have to put an adult patient in here, and they're absolutely insulted. But if they ever have to come back, they put a reservation in for it. Anyway, it's sort of a fun thing. Anyway, I think that's sort of finished. No, there's mother. <laughs> <laughs> get my, uh, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Margo. Mary Nestanera. Oh, you don't need that? Okay. This is Mary Nestanera. Excuse me. Um, being asked to uh, describe myself, uh, a description uh, came to mind. A fellow faculty member said, Oh, well, you're a three year wonder. Um, I graduated uh, from the three-year master's program at UCLA uh, two and a half years ago, the first uh, graduating class in that program, which was rather an interesting uh, experience in and of itself. Um, to back up a little bit, uh, I had a family that insisted that I be educated before I choose a profession. And uh, in doing that, I uh, spent four years at UCLA, a couple of years in engineering, a uh, year in art. and eventually got a, a history degree, um, a BA in history. I used to take history classes to keep my grades up when I was in engineering. And my senior year when I thought, well, it's time for me to graduate, I thought I had enough history classes to get a degree. And it turned out that I did, so I thought that's convenient. And then I applied to architecture school. And uh, I'd always wanted to go into architecture and please my family. I quote, got educated first. Um, and it turned out, I think, that it was a, a reasonable thing to do. Um, particularly from my viewpoint of what architecture is all about. Um, it's kind of interesting. I worked only for about a year and a half before plunging into teaching. Uh, John Fisher called me one day when I was uh, just home from work, actually, and asked if I'd like to come to Syracuse, New York, to teach. And I thought, hmm, well, no, I wasn't interested, but where's Syracuse? And he said, uh, upstate New York. So I thought about it for a while. and. Uh, happened to mention to my parents, my father said to me, well, it's just a, a few hours from uh, New York City. Um, gee, it'd be really fun to go back there. And I thought, it might be fun to get out of Los Angeles. I'd gone to school at UCLA for seven years. And I found out that Syracuse is in what's known the snow belt in upstate New York. And uh, it was 108 inches of snow and a very light winter later that I decided I very much had to come back to California. Um, and actually, uh, I'm told that that was a very light snowfall and that it was a very sunny winter. And at the end of every month, they always used to tell you how many sunny days there were in the month. And I remember in February, which is only 28 days anyway, uh, they said there were two sunny days. I thought, this is it. I'm going home. And uh, so I, I came back to California and am teaching now at Cal Poly. Um, People usually express a little bit of shock that uh, I'm teaching after such a short time working. Um, I have tried to work a little bit while I've been teaching. And I think uh, I was a little bit shocked, actually, in my first experience in teaching um, because my view of things was so diametrically opposed to a lot of uh, the other faculty, particularly some of the old guard. Um, it was sort of a shocking experience for both, and I suppose uh, good for both, um, and a little bit painful for both, too. Um, right now, I taught uh, second and 
third year design at Syracuse and am teaching first year design to 182 students at Cal Poly and, uh, and at the graduate level. Very interested or very thankful that the quarter is over and I'm going to be teaching a much smaller group next quarter. Um, I don't, didn't bring any slides tonight. I would have liked to have shown some of the fun things the students have done. I haven't got any project that I would really call my own other than student work, but I hope to be building a house this summer, which I'm very excited about. Um, it's kind of interesting thing that uh, I wanted to say when we were talking earlier. Um, I always find it a little bit interesting that there's so much call to um, talk about women in architecture. And I don't know how many there really are uh, in education, but I always seem to come to mind. And I was saying a couple days ago that it's kind of a painful experience to begin sort of just getting your feet on the ground in the limelight. Everybody's sort of watching. And I think that that's probably uh, a problem that women have more than men. And I think that in most situations, a woman is never on an equal footing with a man. She might be at an advantage or she might be at a disadvantage, depending on the character she's dealing with. But very, very, uh, not very often on an equal footing, uh, at least in my own experience. I remember when I finally decided that I'd had enough engineering, it was because I ran into a guy that uh, said that a woman had to be better than equal, be better to be equal. And I just, in my own reasoning, that didn't work, and I sort of was tired of engineering and numbers and everything anyway, so I changed to art, which is kind of a strange thing to do. It was kind of fun. Um, but I, I really, when you sit down, I think, and really try to think of what the issues are. At, at school, I know I get handed things having to do with affirmative action, and then it's taken care of. I may never look at it, but it's taken care of if I get it, and uh, I think that's an interesting thing, too. Um, it's not something that I resent, but it's something I really wonder about. Um, and we've certainly seen tonight that there are women who do architecture very well, and there are men that I'm sure that we all know uh, do architecture very well, and I really wonder what the big commotion is. There certainly, in Europe, there are, um, as was mentioned, more equal um, numbers of women in architecture, and certainly in the Asian countries, you see p women in engineering and architecture more than, than here. And I wonder what it is about this country of ours that we think of as sort of being modern, that is so backward <laughs> about architecture. Um, and something that I've been wondering a lot about recently, and I certainly don't know, <clears throat> don't know the answer to. Um, it might be something we can talk about tonight. So. Thank you, Mary. One of the things we have been talking about is the AIA uh, report that, or study that's been going on for the last two years that culminated in a little memo that was published in January and February. Perhaps some of you have seen these. We've had them at school, and um, I understand there's a new uh, publication. No, I don't have that. We'll talk about that. Okay. Uh, the kinds of things that they talk about are uh, changing registration laws to make them equal, uh, encouraging women to participate in AIA, and uh, for women in architecture to talk at career days and encourage young women to get involved with architecture and all of those, which can be kind of classified in, in that quote, affirmative action bag. Uh, I just wonder if you have particular feelings about this kind of... Uh, Involvement. Margo? I'd like to make a couple of comments because I think I may be the senior member of this group and I see a lot of changes which are all in the right direction. But, uh, for example, uh, Mary mentioned that uh, in Europe uh, women have a better opportunity. I'd like to point out that, for example, in Russia, over 50% of professionals such as doctors, engineers, and architects are women, but there are none of them in management positions. The same is true in China. Uh, the, uh, there are more and more women, of course, going into these fields. Uh, 
I think even in countries like Italy and France, from what I've heard, the same is true, that women, certainly in their own independent offices, uh, they don't have an equal position. They may be coming into the field. So I don't think that we have to be that negative about this country. In this country, we have only very recently become conscious of it, and it takes a long time to change attitudes. And there are attitudes on both sides that need to be changed, not only the men that don't accept the women, but the women to think of themselves in terms of being able to do the same things or do whatever they want to do and just uh, go on their own merits, which is really an important thing. The other thing, of course, is that sense of humor always helps and it doesn't help only women, it helps everybody all around and it's pretty well essential to whatever you're doing. Uh, as far as the AIA, it's interesting to hear what you said about Pasadena chapter, to which I used to belong. Uh, Jean Driscoll was the first woman president that that chapter ever had. And um, Jean was a marvelous person. She had been active for many years. She said that uh, she had finally agreed to run for president when she felt that the time had come that it would be accepted, that earlier there would have been a great deal of resentment. She didn't want to do that. So that, uh, you know, I think the, just the fact that we're here discussing these issues, that we're here as a, being invited as a group of women, all of these showed a change in attitude. And uh, the rest of it, I think, was going to come fairly soon. In fact, the AIA did this study uh, a few years ago when the convention was here in San Francisco. There was a very, very close vote, the AIA, on whether to take a public position on women. And you should have heard some of the debate and the fact that it even came up at all was already a step forward. So I really think we're over the, the worst of it. And fortunately for all of you that are coming in now, uh, you can, uh, things will be what you make it. And you won't be stuck with as many obstacles as there used to be beforehand. Or at least I certainly hope that it'll be that way. It's interesting, you're mentioning Jean Driscoll being, having been president of the Pasadena chapter. One of the things that it talks about uh, is the fact that there's uh, four new presidents of uh, AIA chapters and one uh, new president of a state chapter, the, like our California Council of AIA, who are women who have begun this year's uh, serving in the AIA. So it's Another thing that you talked about, some of the uh, negative uh, experience you had looking for work, do you feel that that has changed and things are more, um, there's more opportunity for young women today? I think that there is in some senses. You know, um, you go to AIA meetings and uh, a lot of uh, older men will say to me, you know, will bring up the subject that they're thinking about things that they never, that they took for granted before, that they're not quite sure yet. I mean, you know, we've all, well, those of us who've been out in construction jobs have had the experiences of like, um, I was out at the extension office building, UCLA, when that was being built. Uh, I was on supervision there and uh, some carpenter calls down to me from about three levels up and he says, uh, I wouldn't let my wife do that. Well, you know, you got comments like that. Uh, you've got to have a sense of humor or you got a problem. I think that, uh, again, these attitudes are changing and they're changing fairly rapidly. In fact, surprisingly so. I, I'm really very optimistic. So I think that many offices now are going uh, and making a big effort to try to provide equal opportunities. Of course, all the offices that are anything to do with government or have federal uh, contracts are under a directive to do so. And so they're going out to look for minorities and women, and they're sometimes under pressure because there is a short supply. At the time I went to school, and until fairly recently, there were about 2% women architects in school, and by the time they got out, about only about 1% or so got registered. So, you know, with a 99 to 1 ratio, if you try to have an affirmative action program, you're missing 49%. I mean, you, you can't do it. Uh, so now that there are more and more women in schools, uh, in all the professions, I think that 
it'll balance out. Do any of you have any feelings about the AIA report or anything relevant to that? Well, okay. Or anything in general? Go. Apropos of the AIA, um, and go from there. I can remember when I got my um, corporate membership, the AIA, and I was lined up. Back in those days, like lined you up, and I was the only female. And the time came, and they said, "Gentlemen, will you please stand, come up to yeah. the podium?" And some people told me that at their table was one of the quote the old timers. And as I went to reach for my whatever the certificate is, he said, "Oh God, isn't there anything sacred anymore?" <laughs> so. That was the feeling as far as the AIA is concerned. Um, I just want to make a comment. Just, it's not, the AIA is doing a lot, you know, and they're really, and there are a lot of younger people in there, which is really, I stayed away for a long time. I took my certificate and stayed home. And it's only recently that they've actually gotten better food and reduced the price. <laughs> that I've gone back, and they have some exciting speakers, and it's really worthwhile, and I've noticed they've had a lot of students, and I think that's really great. I think that's really wonderful, rather than just sitting around at a god-awful dinner with a lot of old-timers. You know, that's what it used to be. Um, one thing is a matter of educating the public and the people that serve the architects. Now, I'm not very well studied in Chinese brainwashing and torture. But my understanding of how they treat the POWs is by, you know, repetitive telling them that their country is bad or something. And my point is, if you're constantly referred to, if all your literature is to gentlemen, dear sir, Mr. Margot Heyman, <laughs> I'm very informal. I answer the phone. Hi, this is Margot. I answered the phone, hi, this is Margo. This man burst out laughing. You're Margo. I said, yes. He said, my, my secretary just wrote you a letter to Mr. Margo. So all I'm saying is, but little by little, it sort of works on one. You get literature, you know, might be for a sauna and there's a naked lady. They never put a naked man in there. It's always a naked woman. And after a while, this just gets on you. The calendars they send out have naked women. <laughs> Scandalion did have a naked man. That's all, and I hung that up. Just that's my own perverted little way. But I'm just saying that this works on one, and I just wanted to express that. I mean, the AIA is doing something for the AIA, and I really think they should educate the masses to the fact that there are women who are not just lady architects; that they can just be architects. We're not always ladies, and. Also, the whole thing about, you know, dear gentlemen, I do my own thing. I always find it funny writing to a contract and saying, dear gentlemen. There's nothing gentle about them. <laughs> and, you know, if we're, if they're chair, have you ever noticed that there are chairmen and chairpersons? We're not, you know, we've completely lost. You know, there's still men and persons. We've, we've made that great, but not everybody is person. I write my letters, and I like, I really get a tongue in cheek, because I say nobody gentle. I write to dear gentle people. Whenever I write to a contractor, they're just, that's my own thing, and, and uh, I really like, that really gives them a little thing, too. But anyway, there's, that's my feeling. But as I say, those things tend to work on one. One becomes sensitive to it. I remember going out, I was, there was a rep who wanted to see me, and I went out, and I said, yes, did you want to see me? She said, oh, is Mr. Heyman coming? I said, look, I said, oh, did you want to see Mr. Heyman? You know, it's that kind of thing. Now, I don't know, <laughs> Lynn, you have your own company, you know, maybe if they come to Lynn. Of course, there are male Lynns, aren't there? We're still looking for Mr. Heyman. <laughs> 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 and I always say, this in St. Louis. <laughs> 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 well, this one of the problems, which I'd say, you know, men poo-poo it and say, oh, don't be bothered with that, or why are you so disturbed? I'm just saying, it's a form of torture if day after day, and every minute you get 
that kind of thing, you know. Oh, the other worst thing is, particularly a rep, and I hate to say, I really sort of become, I know how old a man is right away. If um, a rep phones me and he calls me honey. <laughs> Let's face it, I don't know how many, if, if somebody's trying to sell an architect something as a representative, I don't know if he calls him buddy, you know. Hi, buddy. You know, he'll say, dear mister, oh, mister, yes, sir. But if it's a female, it's a deer, it's honey. You know, regardless, you know, I'm not. Um, once in a while, I get my courage up, and I, I did a one f sort of a client's rep. He said, honey. And I said, my name's Margo. I said, oh, he said, I'm so sorry. I'm so, you know, and he went on and on, and then um, I met him. And he said, you know, I told my wife about it, and just on and on. But, you know, the, their whole particularly an older group of men, their whole, it just completely shatters them. It amazes me. But that's, I just want to comment of the little things that we run into, you know. <laughs> Other than yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, can I say something more sure. about the same um, Like, I, I deal, I'm, I have a specialty in the sense that I deal with restaurants, so I, most people in the industry know, because um, I've been working for seven years and done pretty many, and most people in the small area that I deal in know at least of me. And so I, I don't, once in a while though, I'll get out of my area and I'll go meet people and uh, the same thing, the, the older age group. And like I remember very well, some of you know Paul McCarty, he and I were going down to see a project in San Diego together with a realtor who was trying to sell him something. And I get out of my car and meet uh, Paul in Long Beach. Paul is also an architect for those of you who don't know him with the city. <coughs> and we get into the back of the car and he looks at me and, oh, oh no, Paul gets into the front of the car and this is a big Cadillac and the guy says, honey, don't you want to get in the front of the car? <laughs> <laughs> and I say, no, I really think I'd be more comfortable in the back. Thank you. He says, oh, come on, get in the front. And I said, no, I really would prefer the back. Thank you. And I get in the back, and he says, what do you do? And I say, I'm an architect. And he, stop, he is silent for about three minutes, you know. And then he said, uh, oh, <laughs> do you freelance? This is typical. I don't know how many of you have been asked this question. Whatever the hell that means, you know. Do you freelance? It sounds like, kind of like a... Uh, <laughs> some other profession, you know, I, I really, and I, you know, I'm getting madder and madder all this time, and I'm, I say, no, I, I have an office, you know, and, and I really, you know, at that point, I'm, I'm just wondering what I'm doing in the car on the way to San Diego, you know, but this is like, I don't know if any of you have this kind of situation, but, you know, you're just saying, like, once you get out of your, uh, you know, your environment that you're used to and you're accepted in, which in my own environment I really feel very comfortable, you know, with everyone, I, because I've been in that same environment for a long time. But these other people, you know, they, it's just like it's another world, especially the older people. You know, the younger people, you, you come in, like, say, to a bar and everybody says, what do you do, what do you do? You say, I'm an architect, and they'll say, Oh, I, somebody said, oh, I never met a uh, female architect before, or something like that. But then, you know, at least that's better than a long pause. And, you know, so that's just some of my experiences. <laughs> just a quick little comment. Oh, please. I've missed out on the new uh, calendars. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I have to say, I said this at the convention to the task force uh, on women in architecture that I, f I, number one, don't like the reference lady architect or a woman architect. Uh, the reference woman architect or lady architect. Uh, an architect, the word to me is a professional. So either you're a professional or, you know, either you wear a skirt or you wear pants. It doesn't make any difference. Professional is professional. And I, I said to the task force that. Uh, they would do well to, and the girls there in particular, the, young, the students, etc., that they should be architects first and women second. 
and until that time, as long as they considered themselves women first and architects second, that they would continue to have problems. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel very strongly in this. I have some kind of strong feelings about that too that, that um, I'd like to express um, t twofold. I think uh, in my experience with women in architecture as separate from men, and I happen to agree with you that a professional is a professional, I believe that there isn't any difference in the job. However, there are uh, uh, women, and I'm sure there are men also, who have chosen, and in fact I know there are men also, uh, who have chosen to be um, professionals on a part-time basis. Now this is everyone's choice, but uh, there are some younger women, at least, who I've encountered in, in school groups who seem to feel, and I'm sh I'm, I don't mean to point out women specifically, let's just say there are some younger persons who were female, uh, <laughs> happen to be female, who wanted to combine both the career and their private lives. And by that I mean, uh, as opposed to working nine to five, 40 hours a week or more than that, they chose to work or choose to work less than that. And yet, uh, specifically I'm thinking of a m meeting that you and I were at, at the university out in the valley, where that young girl happened to feel that she would like to do that, specifically work part time and have a home life. And yet she felt, that she should be afforded the opportunity to do this and still advance. And I think that everyone should know, man or woman, who wants to do this and, and come to grips with the fact that it, I don't, I don't personally know of anyone who's made a success in this business, <coughs> pardon me, without putting in their dues time, and by that I mean their 12 hour days and so forth. Maybe there are people who have and one's definition of success is different, of course, but when I'm talking about this, the standard everyday success or, or building up your own office or something like that, coming to a position in someone else's office of some importance, um, I personally don't feel it's possible to do that, to build up a strong office or come to a position of importance in another important office without working a minimum of 40 hours a day on a regular basis. And I think that anyone should, anyone, male or female, should understand this. That there's a lot of talk about, uh, you know, making up a team of two people doing one job and all kinds of, of versions of this. And it's, in my opinion, it's, I, it's an idealistic thing that cannot be done because two persons working uh, four hours each do not make one person making eight hour, working eight hours a day. Just as this example, uh, there's no continuity. When uh, Mr. X, the client, calls at six o'clock or, or whatever hour and wants to know what the answer to the problem is and uh, the first person is not there or, or whatever, it just, this is a type of thing. Architecture is a profession and in my opinion to, to to try to fit schedules around in loose formations will not work if you want to be the, the, the core of an office. If you want to have an office or be in a position of major responsibility. Any other position, any number of positions on a team can be worked this way. But if you want to be the core, I think it's important that everybody understand that you can't do that and work part time. And that pertains to men and women. That's really interesting, Lynn. There was a whole issue of AD several months ago uh, devoted to British architects, women in architecture in Britain. And some of the things that they are trying to work out are just the things that you're talking about, having children, working part time, making accommodations. Um, That's all possible, but, but there has to be a core there. There always has to be a management and the satellites around it. There is no such thing as true equality. There's always a leader or a group of leaders, and then there's the team, and there isn't any other way to do it. 
So you feel it would be possible if it were peripheral positions rather than I wouldn't than even lead call it position. peripheral, but a member of the team. It's the, each one is important. As we all know, if, you, if a t team is composed of, make a little team, a, a designer, a, a job captain, a project architect who deals with the client, the engineers, an interior person, just to make a little team, any one of these people, the interior person doesn't get involved in real life until the very end. So there's nothing wrong with that person be having other interests and other activities such as a home or any or other businesses or whatever. I'm just using this person specifically. It could be an engineer or anything. But somebody has got to be there so that when the client calls at any hour of the any reasonable hour, they can get uh, you know, they can get some information that's up to date. Even unreasonable if you if you let them get out of hand, <laughs> which they'll try. <laughs> Do you have some questions? We would entertain some questions from the audience. I'd like to know how the AIA proposes to incorporate more women in its membership. I mean, first of all, I'm an architect, and I have never been approached in any way by the AIA. However, my husband's an architect; he never was either. <laughs> Are you licensed? Yes. I think that's one point of contact. When you obtain your license, I think they, there's always a newly licensed architect's party where you're invited to attend and they court you in that way. That's usually the point of contact. What happens after that? <laughs> <laughs> Well, the member, uh, the membership is down at local level, and the institute uh, wrote that paper. Uh, I can answer you what the chapter is that you're doing. Uh, they are convinced that to get membership, you have to do it at a one-to-one -one basis, and there is a large number of. Uh, younger architects licensed who don't belong to the AIA. One of the hurdles, of course, is that uh, the uh, membership fee is high. And the second thing is to convince the younger architects that it is worthwhile to join the AIA. Their membership recruitment program here and probably in other chapters hasn't been that good. I, d I think just the uh, newly licensed party that they give is really not sufficient to inspire people to join. But I think you're right. If you were contacted, uh, it would certainly go a long way. It would be at least 50% of the bottle that somebody, that you know that somebody cared enough to contact you personally. Mm -hmm. And this is what we are proposing to do here locally. Leave us your name and we'll see that you're contacted. <laughs> you can join as an associate member. Uh, even though you're a corp, you're licensed, uh, you can uh, be an associate member for three years unless you become the principal of a firm and the, the uh, membership dues are less. So this is one way to ease in. Also, if you get in, then you can work for lowering the, the uh, dues altogether, which I think would be worth doing too. So do join and, you know, put in your two cents. Any other questions? Um, Elsa? Two, two things. One, on the point, Lynn's point of not being able to carry on without someone there all the time. I know of many firms where the core people travel a lot, but they have various jobs in hand. Whenever anyone wants to call them, they're in New York or Philadelphia or wherever. So you can be at home feeding the baby or you can be at New York. You're perhaps more available when you're at home feeding the baby. But when you, well, when, oh yes, if you're available on the phone, it doesn't matter what but, you're doing. But my point is that you can be the head of a firm and not, you can delegate someone to be there all the time. That's it. But you, yeah. but you don't have to be there all the time if you are the... Heavens no, but you've delegated it to someone. I mean, just being a head of the firm doesn't necessarily mean that you are the key person for a project. For a project. But someone has to be the key person. But it is project. possible to work without being in the office all the time and have oh, a, a responsible job. Maybe I didn't make myself clear. I'm sure I did. Uh, what I mean is <coughs> any given client or project 
in my opinion, no, whatever my opinion is worth, uh, has to have a person, whether that person be a junior draftsman, I don't care what title you give them, but, or her, but the person has to be A, available. In, in other words, if you have two clients, two major clients, and you're the owner of the firm, and you're in New York with client number one, well, by the third time that you're in New York with client number one, client number two is going to have found another architect. If yeah, you don't have somebody in that office who is very up to date, you certainly on have that to keep project. someone briefed. But but the, what you said was that you cannot expect to advance if you're not available all the time. I'm just saying that there are ways of. But what you're asking, and I don't, I don't say that there are no ways. But what you're asking, in my opinion, as an employer, is special treatment. In other words. Why should an employee, and I'm a woman, I'm all for women, I hire women, you know, and all that. And after all, I am one, you know. But I won't give anybody special treatment, because what that means is, I'm going to have to pick up on that work, and why should I? You know, I'm not hiring somebody to make it convenient for them to work for me. I'm hiring someone to get rid of some of my load. Perhaps what I'm saying is that I'm, I'm not asking to be hired under those conditions. I would do the hiring, and I would say that one can make a viable career um, by being in a position of command rather than by being an underling. Um, the, the other thing that I noticed in the AIA report was very admirable quotas to increase year by year the number of women in the profession in teaching, etc. But I, their recommendation to bring up the salaries to the same equal status as men over a period of years seems to me unreasonable that that is something which could be done here and now and not give somebody the loophole to employ someone with paying, a woman paying her 67% of the total because the AIA report now says that this is okay for this year. Um, I, I'd also like to point out, as probably everyone here knows, that there's an association of women in architecture in Los Angeles. Most of these women here are members, and the fees are lower. <laughs> and it's, it's quite a gratifying organization to be in. But isn't that what the AWA stands for, standing out? I mean, I don't know you all are not more knowledgeable than I, but I've gotten the impression that many people in it, you know, say, um, like, you know, if you think you're worth more money, you got to go up and say, hey, I'm worth more money, pay me more money. Absolutely. I'm just saying that this is now a written report well, saying think, yeah, that, right. that people can use it to back up, especially in these times when work is hard to get anyway and pay is low. Glenn? No, I have a question. No. It's a very pragmatic view from almost everybody on the panel. I guess Ina was furthest out. And um, I wonder whether that's something intrinsic or what, what develops that. In other words, I don't could you fill me in, you being women architects, could you fill me in on, on you, a women that are doing rather adventuresome projects and sort of leading the profession in, in areas that are not normally associated with architecture as it's practiced today? And if not, why, why do you find this so? I noticed there was a three-minute silence <laughs> after your question. Um, I think I can give you a qualified answer. Uh, except for school, where um, probably stu women students are trying things out just as well as, as men, there are really so few women in private practice that uh, uh, it's hard to, to get even a statistical number. and. Um, I really can think of very few altogether, uh, let alone some who are doing things that are far out. Uh, 
so to answer your question, I don't think that uh, uh, fighting a double battle is what uh, these women are after. It's hard enough just to keep your head above water and uh, let alone trying to do something far out. Now, uh, perhaps I give you a part answer, speaking for myself, which is that, uh, that I've, for one, gotten involved with uh, a lot of things that involve the community. And, and uh, Edna touched upon, uh, Ina touched upon uh, uh, the justification for some of those projects out in Venice area, uh, whether that was the way the area should go. Uh, I've been involved through the Los Angeles Community Design Center of giving a voice to a whole group of clients that were never uh, consulted before because uh, they were just the users and they were never thought of as clients. So in that sense, perhaps that's something that's a little bit far out and that's about as far as I know about, except for purely academic type projects. Is that an answer or not an answer? <laughs> It's too large, I don't know where to start. Um, first of all, it uh, depends on what you call far out, what your definition of far out is. And I think each one of us have our own individual definition. Um, I personally have always tried to work in a certain direction that was in accord with my political beliefs. And that was most often at, at um, in part at least in conflict, certainly with the context in which I had to work at large and very often with the client um, body that I was involved in. And a lot of energy goes into uh, fighting for certain battles, uh, one which you've just talked of, a major battle I fought for with the government, with the Ministry of Education in Britain was to involve, give us money and time, to involve the users in participatory planning um, in the days before that became a very common uh, mode. Uh, that, for me, was the cutting edge then. Uh, it's not the cutting edge any longer, but I think um, it's the, in answer to your overall question, that for each person there is an individual uh, struggle that goes on that is in accord with that individual's interpretation of their role as an architect in the particular context that, are, that they're operating in. And I think tonight, uh, this group um, perhaps didn't have uh, the occasion to describe in detail their particular philosophies and the way in which they practice in accord with that philosophy. Um, I'd like to think that um, each person uh, in their own way was as adventuresome as any man would have been in the same context. I don't think we are any less adventurous as a group, or any more pragmatic as a group. And I, I feel that quite strongly, actually. <laughs> Kenny? Um, you've all kind of talked about equality, and I, I kind of wish you would have talked about differences. Uh, it seems, I think, I mean, do you think there's a difference in the way females approach design as opposed to males? <coughs> and if not, why? I think people approach it as people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Every background. Yes. Yeah, you're going to approach it differently than he is. Um, three guys, three girls. I don't think it make any difference. It's up to your individual value system. And, uh, you know, from, from experiences like in the classroom, that where, where I'm at in the program, for example, it seems to me that you start to see, and you can actually see when a woman has done the work, you know, and you can pick out a type and go, okay, a woman did this. Why? And I don't know why, but see, the development of the interior space has been my experience. I mean, I see they fit in the interior. <laughs> 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 I'll make one comment to that. When you go to any theater, you can tell the men in the women's rooms because they don't work. <laughs> the being open enough and approaching the women's problems, but you, it doesn't seem to me like there's a real crisis the way you ladies have presented it this evening. It seems like 
Well, yeah, it's a little resistance, but it's not, you know, as bad as I envisioned it being. I don't I know think they say, it's I thought you'd say it's the other way around. It was all modified our experiences because it, the worst thing we want this to be is the right session. Right yeah. session. And we've all got, you know, 15, 20 years of those stories. And it's a very negative mm -hmm. approach. And I think we're all actually modifying that. Society yeah. still raises that some, I would say, that children's spies and a uh, couple of the experiences have been that they've been from European backgrounds, uh, from an attitude that you weren't a daughter, except that the attitude was somewhat open. Uh, the people that you, that, like I associated with, my going on to get my license, uh, going on to get my master's degree, was through supportive people around me. Uh, that mm, as I was going through the process of evolving, that I had people who were supportive at different points. Otherwise, I think any, any other gal who had maybe been in the same circumstances might have evolved in the same way. Society has not evolved, in my opinion, to make it as easy for a girl you know, there's, there's one thing to become an architect, to go through the schooling, to then become licensed, and it's another thing to make it as an architect. And this is where the difference comes, and a lot of the women then, where they can, split and go out on their own, and to make it within a company where they're predominantly men where the men get together, where there are a lot of the, the classic business lunches and all the men get together. This is where the difference is. There are very few, uh, there, might, there are many companies that might have a token female that might get to a certain department head level, but they rarely get to a partnership level. Uh, there are many little ways that they're kept back. And uh, I'm sure we could all go into the details of that. And this is true in all the fields, in all fields that women are at. You know, that's uh, you know but something else. The, uh, sort of thing right now. You know, but there's a lot of um, uh, negative to the w woman. You know, I've never felt that I was a woman's liver. I don't know how many women here have felt we were just being, trying to be architects. <coughs> That's all we wanted to be. We weren't women's libbers. I find the most violent women libbers are the housewives, who really, you know, really, they're the ones who seem to be out there rebelling. I've never felt that I had to be, I've never been a woman's libber. All I wanted to do was do my own thing as an architect. No, I'm talking about in consciousness in terms of raising Okay, there's a lot of, okay, uh, there's a lot of backlash as a result of that. Uh, like, I have a thing about being Ms., even though I don't like the sound of it. I'm not Miss, and I'm not Mrs. And somebody on the phone said to me, well, is that Miss or is that Mrs.? And I said, it's Ms. And they said, oh, ha, ha, oh, ha, ha. I don't need that. You know, that's irritating. Can he just take it and say, oh, yes, okay, fine. Uh, there's a backlash because of that, because of it. And I, you know, I don't like it. I hadn't I eased it. I can interject here on this. Uh, the raising consciousness is very important for people who have been housewives, who never thought of any options. But the ones of us who are sitting here didn't need any consciousness to be raised, you know. Uh, we were a man sitting way back and we would have a profession. And so, uh, women's lib came along after we were all already set in the direction we wanted to go. I think women's lib is useful because it has made a lot of people think about an issue which never was an issue to them before. So that's why I think you won't find anybody on this panel being a woman's liver because we already fought our battles long before. I'm not against it, you know, I'm just, uh, it doesn't apply to me directly. Are you willing to work for it? Are you willing to be politically active? I've been working for it for 25 years. I mean, the fact that I made it to school. Oh, it sounds like you're working just for yourself and not for, course, it, and well, not for any larger political. No, uh, I certainly 
uh, and tried to do my bit to make it more possible for women to take a legal place uh, in every way I could. But you see, uh, to me, that's not the big issue because it's not the latest religion that I've just discovered that faith has been followed, you see. I already discovered architecture a long time ago, and that's what I'm trying to do. The no, it's hard. I'm sorry. I'm going to say the fastest way to, to get stopped in an office or anything to do is to be number one a women's liberal. You know, and it, if you work to be a good professional, to be good at what you're doing, you can go a lot further and do a lot more to convert people just through ex example than to stand there and try to put a movement on as a whole. Mm -hmm. And today, there's, you know, let's face it, with the economic depression. There are so many architects who just are out of work that it's hard enough just being an architect. But we don't have the time, you know, to make it a major political cause. I, I don't, that's not what I went into architecture for, to spend my time being politically active for women. I'm just trying to do my thing. I think the one, the one positive thing that's come out of the, the women's movement for me is that is that I finally met other women architects, I think, until mm -hmm. a few years ago. I didn't even know that any others existed. And I think gatherings like this have been really helpful for me to, because I, I know that there are other people who have gone through the same things that I've gone through. And it's, it's been really good to just, for us to be able to know each other and to talk to each other. And I think that's a very supportive thing. And I think for students to, to be able to get together, for women students to be able to get together and to, to meet with, with women professionals and to be able to work with each other, I think, could also be, be very mm -hmm. helpful and very supportive. Because there, there are still a lot of, a lot of difficulties that we're all going to face. I mean, they're not, they're not insurmountable, and we've all, we've all worked with them, and we've gotten through them, and we're going to continue to. But, but it helps to know that there are other people who, who are in the same boat that you can, you can talk to. Them about. Uh, one of the, one of the big comments that, that uh, we have a really good school, and I don't think there's a lot of resistance to women being architecture here, and men really, really respond well.